If you weren't here last week, Father Bill preached an excellent sermon on second chances and how Jesus gave Peter this second chance to feed his sheep. It's amazing to think about how Peter's faith was rocked to such failure there in the courtyard, but that through that failure that he would become the rock of faith, a reversal of his faith in action. The truth is, we all fail in life, but we don't have to be failures. I tried to think of a a witty way uh, to say this, and this is what I came up with. Failure? No. Fail, your response determines the result. In other words, if you stay down in life, that's where you become a failure. If you get up and you keep on going, we become overcomers. In order to do this, we need to have the right attitude, perspective, and faith. And so I just want to give you a few quotes. These are some that I I really love. The first one about attitude, C.S. Lewis writes, Failures, repeated failures, are finger posts on the road to achievement. One fails towards success. And we can see the positive attitude in his thinking as he's saying in his life, everything is propelling him forward when he's in the Lord. And perspective. This is a quote by Brennan Manning. If you've never uh, read him, he has an amazing testimony. He says, suffering, failure, loneliness, sorrow, discouragement, and death will be part of your journey. But the kingdom of God will conquer all these horrors. No evil can resist grace forever. This is the ability to see beyond what's right in front of us, that we have a perspective of, the, of, of God, that we can see through the lens of providential promises, that we know that He is in control, and that leads us to faith. Joyce Meyer says, no matter what has happened to you in the past, or what is going on in your life right now, it has no power to keep you from having an amazingly good future if you will walk by faith in God. God loves you. He wants you to live with victory over sin so you can possess His promises for your life today. This is faith that at the core of who we are that we do believe God is good all the time and all the time God is good. That He will provide for everything we need. You know, this morning, I want us to tie in all of our Scripture readings from Revelation. We didn't read the epistle, but we're going to talk about it. And then the Gospel of John to help us move forward beyond those failures that we can transition from becoming sheep and become shepherds. We're going to answer three questions while we do this. What is our hope? Or where is our hope? What is our here? And what is our now? Will you uh, pray with me? Father, we invite you to come into this place to move in power Lord, to speak to our hearts, Lord, that we all know we want to love you more, to follow you closer, and we need you by your Holy Spirit to do that. So, Lord, just bless this place and open your word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So last night, Kelly and I went to a baby gender reveal party. Now, some of you are older might go, what in the world is that? Well, it's just a, a, this thing that basically, I, I believe it's, you know, so you get more presents. You have a, a baby shower, then you can have a gender reveal shower, and you get more goods. But the basis of, of this is uh, to find out, is it a boy or a girl? No one knows. And so uh, this was for Shane and Scarlett Mercer, and it was pretty phenomenal. They had um, a paraglider come in and release the color smoke to let everyone know, and good news, it's a boy. The Mercers are having a boy. Zali is excited to be a big brother. But there's one fact about these gender reveal parties. They can't do it again. They can't go back and say, let's have another party and see if it'll be a girl. Right? It's impossible. The proclamation has been made. There's only one possible outcome. It can't be altered. And that's the same that's true in the book of Revelation. It's not the book of revelations. There's only one revelation. 
There's only one proclamation made by God which says this can't be altered. This is where we can answer our question, where is our hope? John's vision begins with the glorified Christ. And then he's taken into the throne room where Jesus and God are being worshipped. Jesus takes the scroll from God's hand and begins unraveling the seals. But before he gets to the last one, in our chapter here in chapter 7, he seals the saints. The same saints who in chapter 14 are there by Jesus' side, redeemed on Mount Zion. Before we jump into this text, I want to let you know that there are many interpretations of who this multitude is that could not be numbered. And for the sake of For us this morning, let's just assume that number includes all of us and all believers. If you disagree with the the tribulation numbers, we can have coffee, we'll have a great talk. But it begins, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out, with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. My heart jumps a little at these verses to imagine the sight, the number of believers so great that John doesn't even attempt to guess or try to explain how many. Well, numbers inform us on the heart of God. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved, according to Acts 2. In Acts 4, it says sometime later, 4,000, 5,000 were saved on one occasion. And then it says the Lord added to their number daily. I am amazed at God's saving power. But then I think back to Nineveh, where 120,000 pagans found God's favor and grace and mercy. Praise the Lord. But then you have the Exodus, where over two million people were saved from slavery by God's mercy and grace. The saving power. All of these great demonstrations, though, they pale in comparison to what John sees here. Here we have multiplied millions who have been saved who are in Jesus' name. That just excites me that God's saving power and His mercy is that great that someday we are going to look and not even be able to see the end of numbers who are believers and brothers and sisters in Jesus. That brings me hope. And then we see this diversity that it says these nationalities, we're told, are from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Here's a multitude that knows no racial, economic, social, or nationalistic distinction. This is truly a heavenly mixed gathering. You know, we need to get used to people who are different than us because we're going to be worshiping for a long time with them. And that's exciting. It says they were crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What's so awesome about this is amidst how diverse this body is, they are worshiping in unity. There is no division among them, even if they're worshiping and there's drums in the worship service. But that kind of brings up a valid question. You know, how many times do we critique church, whether it be the liturgy or the sermon or the worship music, maybe denominations? We've probably all been guilty of it, but there will be no critiquing the worship in heaven. Here, John sees this multitude from every nation represented all tribes and peoples and languages. And what then? Jesus says, now open up. We're going to go through the 1979 right to Anglican worship order. Well, maybe. Maybe not. But that's the truth is we get so our heads stuck on what has to be worship that we sometimes miss that there's many different forms to praise the Lord. They worshiped in unity. I think about that, our world so vastly different, yet how we need to be unified, especially when the, the world is dividing around us, how the church needs to be unified in Jesus, not just St. Clement's, but Christians around the globe. 
You know, differences, divisions, they're nothing new. Paul was called to unify the church in Corinth. He said, there must be no division among you that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Another, I follow Bill. Another, I follow Rick. Another, I follow Travis. Still another, I follow Christ. Now, I obviously am a heretic for changing the text, but the point's clear. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's saying, no, we are all unified in Christ. There's multiple reasons that we find division. We find differences theologically, cultural. And sometimes it's the practices, the style of worship. A lot of times we find ourselves uncomfortable when it's not what we like. And even judging what is Christian worship. I think usually that's because we have our own best interests and our only our perspective in mind versus having that eternal perspective. I want to show a short clip in just a second, and I was really hoping to find and be able to share the clip of uh, my procession during my ordination. If you don't know, I was ordained into the diaconate in Kapchorwa, Uganda, and it was an amazing service. I was the first Mzungo to be ordained in Kapchorwa, so I was the first white guy, and thousands of people came to be part of this service with the ordination of me and seven of my Ugandan brothers. And it was amazing, like the energy, the excitement. Right before the service started, you hear this, and like all of a sudden, everyone stands up and starts praising the Lord, dancing, and then my brother leans over to me and said, Travis, you know you have to dance down the aisle. I was like, all right, let's do this, and dance down the aisle. And so, um, this is just to give you, I didn't find that clip, but this is just to give you an idea of the, the, the atmosphere. Um, just a moment. I ask these three to have now made, to have been made deacons, and this is to face the congregation. And the way to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, looks a lot different than an 8:30 service at St. Clements. <laughs> that service was four and a half hours long. We would be in the middle of a sermon and someone just felt the spirit moving and we'd get up and everyone would get up and we'd sing for another 20 minutes. Some of you think that would be awesome to have a service like that here. Some of you probably are squirming in your seat just imagining how uncomfortable you would be being just watching that, like being in a service for that long. But the point is clear that, that there is so much beauty in unity in our diversity. And I went to this uh, an ecumenical seminary meeting, lots of denominations were represented, and you could always pick out the first year students because they were the ones at the lunch table getting in heated arguments over infant baptism, predestination, uh, charismatic gifts. And I remember one of my first classes, it was a Baptist professor, and so he made light of his own denomination to teach us a point. And he said, you've probably heard the story about the wall up in heaven. Well, you could hear all these people on the other side of the wall cheering and praising and and just singing praises to the Lord. Well, there was a man who just arrived up in heaven on the other side of the wall, and he asked the man next to him, he said, who are all those people over there singing? And he said, oh, those are the Baptists. They think they're the only ones up here. It illustrated a good point to us, though, that we always have our minds think that we know what's perfectly right and there's no leeway when so many times we are all on the same side of Jesus. And humanity will always have prejudices. 
whether they're intentional or not, but that's what I love, that God has no prejudice, that he will take any soul that will come to him in faith. And maybe we won't fully realize that here until Jesus returns, but we can make strives to live like that. Where is our hope? It's in this revelation that awaits us as true worshipers. We have been forgiven on the cross. We've been washed by the blood, and heaven awaits. So what is our here? According to Revelation 5, it says we are living in a kingdom as priests. Did you know that, that every one of you is a priest? You might not have a collar, but you're a priest. Martin Luther said it like this. He said, all baptized believers are called to be priests, but not all are called to be pastors. And Peter says, the baptized by regeneration and the anointing of the Holy Spirit are consecrated into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood in order that through all those works which are those of the Christian man, that they may offer spiritual sacrifices and proclaim the power of him who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Proclaim the power. I love that. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. It is the power of God for salvation for all who believe, whether Jews or Gentiles. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria, and all the ends of the earth. And Peter received the Holy Spirit, and a sheep became a shepherd. He could now feed the lambs. It's recorded he began healing a man crippled from birth. He preached the gospel boldly at the temple, and 5,000 were saved. But it didn't stop. More power kept coming. In Acts 4, it says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Then in verse 33, a great power came upon them and allowed the apostles to continually testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. People began getting healed left and right, coming to faith in Jesus and surrendering. And then Peter heals a man who had been crippled for decades. As in chapter 9 it says, Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. Now, this might have been the greatest miracle they had ever seen. Charles Swindoll writes about it. He said, there's many of us for years have been saying, arise and make your bed to our teenagers, and it's never worked. <laughs> and if you don't think it gets much better, we have our epistle reading for today where we, where we find a disciple named Tabitha who fell ill and died. What does Peter do? He raises her from the dead. Why don't we talk about that story ever? We know Jesus can bring Lazarus from the dead, but Peter is a mere human man. But all of a sudden, with supernatural strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, he's raising the dead. The same spirit that he gives us in this church. What is the here? It is becoming priests in a kingdom who pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to do the supernatural, to bring testimony to God, people to faith, and to heal the sick. It's nothing to be frightened of. It's something to be enlightened of. We have to ask it. We have to want it. And finally, what is the now? We worship. Here's a question for you. Who's the worship leader of the service? Rick. It is not Rick. The answer is Bill today. Bill is the celebrant. Because our worship music is not the only worship that happens here. This entire service is a worship service. Liturgy, the work of the people, it's an interaction between priests and lay people praying together and worshiping the Lord. But it doesn't end in the service. Outside these walls is a worship service going on every day if you want to partake in it. Work is worship. Now guys, hear me. I didn't say worship work. Worship can be in work. In fact, worship can be in everything we do if our minds are focused on Christ. 
He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, that you may know and discern the perfect will of the Father. But we have to have that right attitude, perspective, and faith. And so he continues. He says, Therefore, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve God's will. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your true and proper worship. It's worship. And most importantly, we have to know the object of our worship. Take a look at our gospel reading. It says, at the time of the festival of dedication that took place in Jerusalem, this means they were celebrating the rebuilding of the temple. The temple was built to praise God and offer services in worship praying for the Messiah to come. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Messiah was walking in the place where they were worshiping, saying, come Messiah. But they they didn't recognize him because they didn't know what their object of worship should be. They were so focused on the temple that they missed the person of Christ. And do you understand what I mean by knowing the object of our worship? All of us can be guilty of this. That we can come to a service on Sunday, sit in these pews, stand up, recite the words, sing the songs, but totally miss the object of our worship. We can just go through the motions. It's when our affections, our praises, and our prayers are lifted, focused on Jesus, focused on the Father, in the Holy Spirit, power, that we find the object of our worship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I want to read this excerpt from one of my devotionals that I had this week. And then I'm going to close this out. But you can follow along as I read. But this really just hits home to understanding and knowing the us of the Trinity. If we don't want to know the object of our worship, we have to know the us of the Trinity. And this is by Charles Spurgeon. It's called Mornings and Evenings. If you don't have this book, buy it. That's all I have to say. You need it. It's a book you need. He says, If we rightly acquaint ourselves with God and be at peace... We must know him as he has revealed himself, not only in the unity of his essence and substance, but also in the plurality of his persons. God said, let us make man in our image. Let not man be content until he knows something of the us from whom his being was derived. Endeavor to know the Father. Bury your head in his bosom in deep repentance and confess that you are not worthy to be called son. Receive the kiss of his love and let the ring which is the token of his eternal faithfulness be on your finger. Sit at his table and let your heart make merry in his grace. Then press forward and seek to know much of the Son of God who is the brightness of his Father's glory. And yet an unspeakable condescension of grace became man for our sakes. Know him in the singular complexity of his nature. Eternal God and yet suffering finite man. Follow him as he walks the waters with the tread of deity and as he sits upon the wall in the weariness of humanity. Be not satisfied until you know much of Jesus Christ as your friend, your brother, your husband, your all. Forget not the Holy Spirit. Endeavor to obtain a clear view of his nature and character, his attributes and his works. Behold that Spirit of the Lord who first of all moved upon chaos and brought forth order who now visits the chaos of your soul and creates order of holiness. Behold him as the Lord and giver of spiritual life, the illuminator, the instructor, the comforter, and the sanctifier. Behold him like holy unction. He descends upon the head of Jesus and then afterward rests upon you who are as the skirts of his garments. Such an intelligent, scriptural, and experimental belief in the Trinity and unity is yours if you truly know God, and such knowledge brings peace indeed. It's beautiful, powerful. You know, how blessed are we that we have this amazing God that when we fall or we fail, he picks us up and keeps us like finger posts moving into the future of success. And we do this by hope. Where is our hope? It's in the revelation of what can't be changed, the message that has been proclaimed and what awaits us as believers. That joy of the diversity of people but unity and worship 
eternally in harmony where pain and suffering are no more and every tear is wiped away from our eyes. And what is the the here? Living in a kingdom as priests. Desiring not to be content with being sheep but having intent of becoming shepherds. Praying for the power of the Holy Spirit that we will be kingdom makers. And now, it's time to worship. The object of our worship being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and offering ourselves as living sacrifices. And I want to close by reading the last two verses in our text in Revelation. But I want to change the tense from the third person to the first person. Because these are words that describe our future. Will you close your eyes? Therefore we will come before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And Jesus, who sits on the throne, will shelter us with His presence. We shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike against us, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be our shepherd, and He will guide us to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.